you will have probably heard people talking about expropriation of land without compensation in most African countries, including South Africa, and you might have been asking yourself why such suggestions are being made and are being entertained in the first place. Unless you understand the law and the history of South African property uh, regime, it may be difficult to comprehend what exactly is taking place. <clears throat> This video is one in a series of videos which give a thorough grasp of the issues related to the history of property rights in South Africa, right from the time of the arrival of Jan van Riebeek up to the present day. And I hope you find it useful. Before you proceed to listen to the video, I would advise you, or rather encourage you, or rather request you to click the like and the subscribe buttons to press that notification bell and to share the videos with your friends remember that your likes and your subscriptions are the very oxygen that give life you know to to, to this channel without your likes and your subscriptions uh, it may be difficult for me to continue to provide you with these videos and uh, otherwise i'll encourage you to contact me at iclassvirtual at gmail.com if you need to do any personal contact with me as we you know you can participate in our community follow us at facebook pilani tanda uh, i hope you find the video useful as i have already said this particular video we are looking at the fundamental aspects of the South African law of property. So we'll be looking at the different aspects, those that lie at the, at the, you know, the core, the concepts that lie at the core of South African property law. As our key concepts, we outline the concepts in property law, we situate the law of property within the broader context. Uh, of the South African legal matrix and then we describe the rights and the burdens or burdens operative in relation to property. Take note of that. The law of property falls within the broad, the broad branch of law which is called the, the law of patrimony which is a, a, a private uh, law branch where we look at the uh, law of persons, law of personality, law of patrimony, and uh, family law. Now, if you follow the red track, you will notice that the law of patrimony uh, includes the law of things, the law of succession, and the law of obligations. So, as I have already uh, highlighted, we are concerned about the law of property uh, and basically, therefore, the law of things. Though, as you will find out, the law of uh, property is much broader than the traditional Roman uh, law of things classification. Uh, in terms of patrimonial law, you notice that your estate or the products of your labor, which have monetary value, are protectable uh, through various branches. We are talking about your assets, that which you have worked for, that which you have acquired through your labor. So you have your law of property and then the law of succession where you, you inherit or bequeath assets to your, to, from you, 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 yeah, you, you leave wealth for your children and their grandchildren. Then the law of personality and the law of obligations, that still falls within the law of patrimony. As we look at this, as we try to understand the law of property, I would like us to take a journey into the history of South African law. Uh, you must understand that uh, South African law is uh, based mostly on Roman Dutch principles of property which have been very influential since the establishment of the Cape Colony. And then you must also understand that there were property rights or there was a concept of property among 
indigenous African communities before the advent of colonialism. So <clears throat> in thinking about property, you must also think in terms of how people related and how people uh, enjoyed property rights prior to the colonization of <clears throat> this African territory. And then you also have to think about the conceptual boundaries of property under the colonial system and uh, the age of property dispositions. You know there was an era when, particularly following the takeover of the Cape of Good Hope by the British after around 1806, you find uh, Boers, that is the Afrikaners, trekking towards the north and occupying the land in the north that is around the present day free state moving into what they then called the Transvaal which is the Gauteng area and moving further even into the northern provinces. So this disposition of property took place from around that time until a, a point where Africans that is indigenous Africans were left to occupy just about 13% of South Africa's land. And that distribution pattern has still not changed since uh, 1994, even with the advent of the new constitution. We also want to understand the twilight of apartheid, some of the changes that began to be entertained by the government of apartheid as it became clear in the late 1980s and as well as early 1990s that apartheid was on the verge of collapse. We also want to think about the post-apartheid property relations. How have, have, have people continued uh, to, to hold and to enjoy property rights since uh, 1994? Have there been any significant changes in land and property distributions? That is the, the racial mix. Uh, have blacks acquired more land rights? or is distribution still in favor of, of whites? So those are some of the questions that do arise from time to time. And you find that the argument in favor of expropriation of land without compensation stems from the slow pace of land distributions. Now, the constitutional property clause, that is section 25 of the current constitution, Previously, Section 28 of uh, the Interim Constitution has attempted to redress the, this land uh, distribution, I mean, skewed patterns. But how much change has actually taken place? Uh, the programs of restitution, redistribution, and land tenure reform uh, arguably have not brought in the desired results in terms of. Uh, uh, distributing land and you know providing access to the large communities that is the indigenous black communities of South Africa who remain at the peripheries and the fringes if one could say of uh, the economic uh, life of, of the country so we are also thinking of how to reconceptualize African customary property rights since 1994 have there been any changes? You will remember that the, in, in, 20, in 2004, uh, the Parliament enacted the Communal Land Rights Act uh, as Act 11 of that year, but it was subsequently declared unconstitutional uh, uh, following a, a certain, that is a court order, uh, rather a court case. So you must, we must be thinking about property rights in the context of all those changes that must be taking place. So in all this, it, it remains very important to answer the question, what is property? How law, uh, how law classifies uh, property? The basis of property, that is the origins of the concept of property. What is the legal basis really for somebody to come up and say they own this particular piece of thing or property or that other one? There are the theories of John Locke, uh, Jeremy Bentham and John Austin 
which are very useful in terms of uh, explaining uh, the, the origins of property, if one could say. Uh, for instance, Jeremy Bentham is one of those who says law and property are born together and they die together. So as far as Bentham is concerned, uh, the concept of property is very dependent upon how the law perceives it. So still thinking of property, we, we think about uh, various facets of property to do with the acquisition, the termination of property rights, and many other facets. And as I have already said uh, above, we need to also think about the state and uh, property, the relationship between the state and property. For instance, the state is very much interested in controlling the property and the, the use and the enjoyment of property, if one would say. For instance, you may own a, a motor vehicle, but in terms of uh, the regulatory powers of the state, you may not drive it on a public road if it is not fully licensed or if you do not own a driver's license. So in that, say, in that sense, you do enjoy property rights, but you can only enjoy them under regulated circumstances. And so that's what we call the police powers of the state, what some people call the police powers doctrine. And then there's also the issue of the eminent domain, the powers of eminent domain, whereby you find that the state has the power and the capacity to expropriate property or land, whatever the nature of the property may be, what may be deemed the compulsory acquisition. In South Africa, it is done in terms of the Expropriation uh, Act. And so you must also remember that whatever property you have, you own and you use, it generates some externalities. For instance, you may own a very uh, loud sound system, like some people who own these large disco systems, and you may enjoy large, uh, I mean, loud music. But remember, when you are playing your music by your own house, uh, your sound then has an external effect on your neighbors. So we talk here about the externalities generated by the use of property. And uh, well, we have a man called Yuko Matei who has written extensively on uh, the externalities generated by property. And we also think in terms of, you know, ex efficient distribution of property. That's where the state does come in from time to time. For instance, in order to ensure food security and to ensure, uh, you know, an equitable distribution of, of resources as well as, you know, sustainable, environmental sustainability and so on the state then comes in and recommends efficient distribution and use of resources. Uh, that is any resources or property that's available. <laughs> so you see, we, we, in our discussion, as we go down, we'll also be looking at the acquisition of property, how you acquire property, how rights in property get to be terminated or what we call the extinction of property rights. And then, of course, the restrictive use of, of property, as we have spoken about, uh, the police powers doctrine, how the state comes in and uh, regulates what you can do with your property, even if it is your property. You know, in the traditional Roman idea of property, they spoke of things. So that's why in some common law books, a, a reference to property or a discussion of the concept of property always uh, gets to be done alongside a discussion of the law of things. Because Romans classified things, the property is things, a thing being an object of rights over which people can exercise some claims. And we have said that the Romans distinguished between 
corporeal or tangible things and incorporeal or intangible things. They also identified and classified a property in terms of movables, uh, for instance, living, uh, you know, livestock, animals like kekli and uh, uh, horses, they would be movable things, and then land and houses being immovable things. And still, uh, with the classification, there were those that were regarded as res in commercium, as well as those regarded as extra commercium, res extra commercium. Now, the res in, com in, in commercium is a reference to those things that can be exchanged in commerce, whereas the res extra commercium are those that are not subject to, to you know, exchange in commerce. For instance, things like the sun and the moon and the stars, they, they were classified as res extra, extra commercium in the sense that you can't own the sun, you can't keep it for yourself, privatize it and prevent other people from, you know, using the sun. So it was outside the realm of commerce. Whilst your horses, your your coach cuts and scotch cuts and wagons, your houses, they were regarded as rest in commercium because they actually get to be used in commerce. They are exchanged in the open market. They are, there's also a, a class of divisible and indivisible things. For instance, take an example of a motor vehicle. If uh, I fix my, you know, a, a wheel or my a wheels, some wheels on a motor vehicle, who becomes the owner of the vehicle? Is it the one who owns the rest of the body? Uh, what about the, the one who is, uh, because maybe you didn't have wheels and tires and somebody gave them to you. Does the one who owns the wheels become the owner of the car? So, in other words, a car, a motor vehicle, is an indivisible thing, which cannot be divided in a sense. So, the same applies to a house. This is indivisible. But there are some uh, uh, properties that could be divided that, such that one person owns a fraction and the other owns the other fraction. Then we also have got consumable and, and non-consumable things. Uh, for instance, can I borrow your food and eat it and then claim to have borrowed it? You see, food gets used up with use. So there are things that can be borrowed and there are things that cannot be borrowed. For instance, the consumables cannot be replaced. If, if you take something, you use it until it is completely consumed. Uh, therefore, that classification is important for those reasons. We also have got fungible... Uh, things as well as infungible or non-fungible things. Now, by fungible things, we mean those things without a, a specific identity. Uh, take an example of money or grain. If somebody approaches you and asks for a, for a loan of, say, 1,000 rands, and you give them that 1,000 rands, you give them certain banknotes, when they bring in, when they bring back, or rather when they repay the loan, they don't have to bring the same notes that you had, uh, you know, given to them. The same applies to grain. 10 kilograms of maize are 10 kilograms of maize, really. You, you can't expect that somebody who had taken your grain will bring back the same seeds. So we are saying fungible things are those without a specific identity. And then the non-fungible ones, such as a car or a house, have a specific identity. If I borrow or if I borrow your car or if I hire your motor vehicle or your car, I must bring it back with the same number plate, that is the registration plate, the same chassis number and the same engine number. I cannot go around and start tempering and moving components and still claim that I'm bringing back your car. That would not be the case. And then we have 
singular and composite things. And we are saying people exercise rights, and real rights and personal rights over things by appropriating them to themselves, by ex ex exerting effective control over them or the objects in order to achieve possession and so on. So those are very important uh, issues to think about. So in an attempt to define the law of property, um, one would say that um, property is a bundle of mutual relations, rights and obligations between subjects in respect of certain resources or objects. So in other words, it's not just ownership of a, a computer that, that is a, a, at stake. It's not that one has physical control over the computer that is at stake. But uh, as we are saying, it's a bundle of mutual relations. When I am the owner of the computer, it goes without saying that I have exclusive rights to keep the computer. I have exclusive rights to use the computer. And meanwhile, you, there is a corresponding obligation on you to desist from interrupting my rights of ownership or enjoyment of my rights over that computer. So property is actually expressed in as relationships which are controlled and protected through the granting and recognition of rights and obligations, and that is by the law. Now, you know, these relationships are defined by the nature of the real rights that the person is entitled to. You will notice that there are different kind of uh, real rights, uh, rights that can be had in respect of property. We have ownership, we have possession, we have servitude, personal and prayerial, you know, we have security rights and so on. So, that's very important in defining the concept of property because somebody who holds a servitude in respect of a certain property he actually enjoys property rights he's not the owner of the property of the farm of the house but by virtue of the operation of the servitude there are certain entitlements that the person has in respect of that property so this then consolidates and confirms the claim made by jeremy bentham that property is a creation of the law as he says law and property are born together and they die together he says without law there is no concept of property so thinking about the facets of property one always has to think of the right to acquire the right to use, the right to exclude, exclude others from disturbing the holder of that property right, the right to destroy the property or the object of the property, as well as uh, the right to dispose of the property, to transfer, to alienate and to encumber the property, that is to impose limitations and obligations in respect of the property. So, as I said earlier on, we have what are called real rights in property or in rem rights. An example, for instance, being proper, uh, rather ownership. Uh, so, in rem rights are rights that are exercised in respect of a particular object. Um, they, are, they should not be disturbed. As I have already given the example of ownership, you find that ownership is the most comprehensive real right that a person can hold in respect of their own property. Some people say it is the cornerstone of all rights. Of course, we know that possession is also a very important uh, uh, right. As some people would also notice that, uh, you, you know, we have this uh, maxim which says possession is 99% of the law. So you find that these facets of ownership entail the rights to use, to enjoy, to destroy, and to dispose of the property, uh, often expressed in the in the Latin uh, phrase of utendi fuendi et abutendi, that is, you utilize, you eat the fruits, 
and you can destroy. So talking still about uh, uh, real rights in property, we've said we have in rem rights and then we have personal rights. Uh, by personal rights, we are talking about uh, rights that one exercises over pro a property in a personal capacity. For instance, if you hire a, a, a property or somebody rents out a, a house, the, 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 the person to whom the house is rented, that is the lessee of a property, enjoys personal rights. He is not the owner, but by operation of, of, of the law as a result of the agreement between the leaser and the lessee, you find that the lessee enjoys property rights in respect of, of, of that property. So we are saying the rights are not in rem rights, but they are personal rights in the sense that they are exercisable against a person, not against the object itself. And then still on the types of property, we have what are called limited rights in the property, that is rights in the property of another. What uh, can be expressed as a, the Ura in Re Aliena or the, the rights are accorded in the property of another person. Uh, we have in this class servitudes, different types of servitudes. We have parietal servitudes and we have personal servitudes. And we also have real security rights such as mortgage, a pledge, which entitle possession of an object of property in lieu of settlement of a claim against the pledger or by the pledgee. So secu security rights are also part and parcel of the rights that can be enjoyed in respect of property. Thank you very much for taking part and being part and parcel of, uh, you know, this presentation. We've come to the end of it and I hope you found it useful. In this series of, series of videos, I have got uh, a video on, what do you call this, a video on um, ownership, a video on servitudes. So you must really follow those videos on ownership, on servitudes, as well as the video on, a detailed video on the history of South African property law. Thank you very much. Remember again to like, to share, and to subscribe to the channel. Thank you.